Welcome to part four of chapter five, Biomechanics. Uh, I'm Dr. Anthony. Uh, we're going to continue our discussion over articulations, joints. Uh, it will help us as we proceed towards muscles. Uh, as we discuss joint stability, we want to think about joint stability as a resistance to dislocation. Another word for dislocation is luxation. Um, I'm tempted to go on a tangent of subluxation, but uh, I will resist. Um, as a chiropractor, that's a tough one to resist. Uh, joint stability is about the ability to resist dislocation. We, of course, do not want dislocation. What tissues would be harmed if we had a dislocated joint? Think about what we've already covered. We would harm the hyaline cartilage, the articular cartilage. We, would, we might harm the articular fibrocartilage, the disc or the meniscus. We might harm the articular connective tissue, the ligaments, tendons. Uh, we could harm the capsule around the diarthrodial synovial joint. We could harm uh, surrounding structures like nerves or blood vessels, veins, arteries. So dislocation can be quite traumatic uh, in its consequences. As we talk about joint stability, I want to talk about two pieces, closed packed position, or open pack position. Um, closed pack position is the area of joint contact is at a maximum, whereas open pack position or loose pack position is the area of joint contact is at a minimum or away from the maximum. Um, uh, an easy example would be in the carpals, closed pack position is extension. You can push your hand, you can feel how tight that is when it reaches full extension. Uh, it's very safe and stable and feels secure. If you push into flexion, you will notice the give, the bounce, the reliance on soft tissue structures to maintain that. Um, closed pack position for the carpal row is extension. Some books will argue radial deviation. Some will argue ulnar deviation in addition to extension. Uh, I'm going to leave that argument for another moment. Uh, but certainly, open pack position would be something near full flexion. <clears throat> um, what's another example? Knee extension. Uh, a fully extended knee would be closed packed. A 90 degree flex knee is open packed. Um, that should be obvious. Uh, it's part of why on the knee discussion, uh, ACL injuries occur with what motion at the knee? Uh, it occurs with stopping and twisting. It occurs with a flexed knee. A uh, bent knee that then the femur continues anteriorly and the ACL is compromised. We talked earlier in the semester about uh, how the PCL is not as often harmed as the ACL because the posterior ligament resists a uh, force of posterior movement of the femur. So when the knee is at full extension and then into hyperextension, why is that protected? Because when the PCL is challenged, the knee is in a closed pack position. So the joint itself, the femoral condyle, the tibial plateaus are assisting the PCL in, res in resisting that force. Um, so again, a closed pack position is the area of joint contact is a maximum. The open pack position is the area of joint contact is at a minimum or it is away from the closed pack position. We'll continue that thought as we go forward. Let's transition to uh, one other topic in this section, and that's form closure versus force closure. Uh, relates a little bit. You can probably imagine how form closure relates to a closed pack position. The joint's form is driving its stability. Whereas in open pack position, we are relying on muscles, ligaments, tendons, which is dominantly force closure. The force of ligaments, tendons, and muscles is now controlling the stability of that joint. I've drawn two very general examples. Uh, the example of form closure is the sacrum on the ilium. Uh, the sacral uh, base, the sacral apex, are shaped in a way that they fit like a lock and key into the iliac uh, ridge forming the sacroiliac joints. Form closure is a great example of form closure because you see how the shape of the bones themselves creates the stability. We don't have a lot of muscles comparatively in the posterior SI region to control this stability. However, force closure, such as the humerus into the glenoid labrum, uh, 
uh, it's a great example uh, of the humerus has a lot of motion. It's a ball and socket, the glenohumeral joint, um, the glenoid labrum only covers about one third of the surface area of the humeral head at any given time. So two thirds is open. This requires the brain and the body to use ligaments, tendons, muscles in the glenohumeral joint to control that joint, to stabilize it. This is a dominant force closure example. Um, it should start to appear to you this is a spectrum. So we can discuss joints on a spectrum of form or force closure on whether they are nearing a closed pack position or an open pack position. Uh, this allows us to have a higher level discussion of what did that joint need, what tissues were available, and what did that person's brain choose to do. Um, and that concludes part four of chapter five.